guys, it's Kayla and Jim and welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. What are we discussing today? Today we are going to do another case study on the April 1991 Andover, Kansas tornado. As usual with all of our case studies, we'll go ahead and we'll give a brief synopsis of what was going on for the meteorological setup as well as diving in deeper to the actual storm that produced the tornado that we're interested in. Now, this storm occurred back in 1991, before your time. A little bit before. But you may have seen some clips on YouTube and, and things like that over the years. Many of you who went through that uh, time period, maybe the storm itself, or maybe just saw it on the news, you saw clips of a more famous incident that led to a lot of discussions today still, and that is, is do you take shelter under an overpass? And that is the video that had the most publicity of watching a uh, film crew from, I believe it was a TV station, and they were trying to outrace the tornado, and they took shelter under an overpass along with other folks. And that video became very famous, and some people actually took that as that's what to do, and then over the years it was debunked not to do that. But we'll get to that in a little bit. But first, Make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down below so you never miss the next one. This tornado was part of a major outbreak that day across the state of Kansas. Just in south central Kansas alone, there were 19 deaths, 298 injuries, and $272 million, approximately $592 million US dollars in 2022, in damages. Now let's get into the meteorological setup for the day itself. On Thursday morning, April 25th, 1991, the National Weather Service was observing many weather ingredients necessary to create a very significant severe weather outbreak, with tornadoes occurring across the central and southern plains. On Friday morning, April 26th, 1991, at 7 a.m. Central Daylight Time, low pressure at the surface was located over southwestern Nebraska. A dry line had extended southward into west Texas. To the east, Dew point temperatures in the low to mid 60s spread over much of Oklahoma and Kansas with a sharp drop off into the 20s behind the dry line. A warm front extended from the surface low pressure center in Nebraska south and eastward through Kansas and northeastern Oklahoma. As the morning progressed, the dry line moved rapidly eastward into western Oklahoma and central Kansas, replacing higher dew points in the 50s and 60s with much lower dew points due to the intrusion of much drier air. As the day progressed, the dry line's forward momentum would slow down significantly by later that afternoon. At 850 millibars, or around 5,000 feet above sea level, a low-level jet ranging from 50 to 60 knots was measured with 7 a.m. Central Daylight Time upper air soundings across the central plains of the U.S. Also noted on the 7 a.m. Central Daylight Time upper air soundings, was a strongly sheared environment and extreme instability with lifted index values between negative 5 to negative 7 degrees Celsius. As heating from the sun warmed the lower layers of the atmosphere, lifted index values of negative 12 degrees Celsius were realized over central Oklahoma and central Kansas. Cape values during the afternoon reached upwards of 4,000 joules per kilogram in some locations. So you may have heard a new term for some of you and that is lifted index and we haven't really done a deep dive on that yet. So what is a lifted index? The lifted index is basically a parameter that takes into account temperature and moisture and a bunch of other things between the different levels of the atmosphere. Kind of gets into some more complicated things, but the important thing to take away is that if you have a lifted index lower than negative six, you have a pretty good chance of having severe storms and thunderstorms. But if you have one that's lower than negative nine, like in this example, we have negative 12. It's like an oh my gosh scenario. <laughs> it's like that's one of the parameters that you look for. And it's like, okay, today is going to be big. To the west, over the southwestern U.S., a mid-level trough was oriented northwest to southeast, which is another indicator of a strong storm system with sufficient mid-level lift. With these ingredients in place, the Storm Prediction Center issued a high risk of severe weather across the central plains of the U.S. At 12.20 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the Storm Prediction Center issued a particularly dangerous situation for a PDS tornado watch, giving strong warnings of the potential for multiple strong to violent tornadoes in and close to the watch area. Over the next 12 hours or so, 23 more severe weather watches would be issued. By 6 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the dry line had pushed eastward into central Kansas and Oklahoma. By 7 p.m., the severe weather parameters were lining up across portions of central Oklahoma and eastern Kansas. 
ample low-level moisture, adequate mid-level cold pools, a strongly sheared wind profile, a dry line moving east to provide low-level lift, and finally a strong jet max all aided in significant severe thunderstorm and tornado development that afternoon and evening, causing a regional outbreak that stretched from Texas to Iowa with the most violent tornadoes across southern Kansas and Oklahoma. So not only was this a highly sheared environment, which is one of the main ingredients that we need for instability and storm development, but we also had a bunch of parameters lining up with the numbers that we needed, such as the lifted index like we talked about, cape values up to like 4,000, which is a lot. So everything was kind of setting up to have the textbook tornado outbreak scenario. That's right, and because of that, the high risk was issued by the Storm Prediction Center because all those ingredients were just coming together. Kind of hard to ignore at that point. Yeah, for real. In fact, they also issued a ton of those particularly dangerous situations, which are not a common thing that they issue. Those are really only issued when you have scenarios like this. So to have 23 watches and a bunch of particularly dangerous situations, it was uh, the Storm Prediction Center knew that something was up today. Now let's dive deeper into the storm that produced the Andover, Kansas tornado. Around 4.36 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the supercell that would later produce the Andover tornado became severe warned in Harper County. By 4.53 p.m., golf ball-sized hail and winds of 65 miles per hour were observed in Harper County. At 5.15 p.m., the supercell produced its first tornado near Anthony, Kansas. It remained on the ground for one mile and was eventually rated an F-Zero. The storm continued moving northeast and spawned another tornado near Freeport, Kansas. At 5.35 p.m., a severe thunderstorm warning was issued for southwest Sedgwick County. The tornado remained on the ground for 16 miles and lifted south of Argonia, Kansas. This tornado would also be rated an F-Zero. A new tornado touched down east of Clearwater, Kansas at 5.49 p.m. This tornado would grow into the devastating Andover tornado later that evening. Fifteen minutes later, the National Weather Service issued a statement urging people near Hayesville, Derby, and Mulvane to seek shelter. At 6.09 p.m., a tornado warning was issued indicating that a very dangerous storm was approaching eastern Sedgwick County. Moments later, the tornado would track northeast and impact the southern parts of Wichita. At 6.20 p.m., Hayesville was first to be hit by the tornado. The tornado would be rated a strong F2 to F3. Around 6.24 p.m., the tornado tore through McConnell Air Force Base, just missing a line of B-1B bombers damaging or destroying nine major facilities, including an officer's club, a base hospital, library, elementary school, and 102 housing units. As the storm continued to track northeast towards US 54 and Andover, a tornado warning was issued at 6.30 p.m. Unfortunately, the tornado sirens in Andover failed, so to warn the public, the Andover Police Department drove through the streets warning its citizens to take shelter from this dangerous storm, including residents of the Golden Spur Mobile Home Park. A few minutes later, the Golden Spur Mobile Home Park, as well as much of Andover, took a direct hit. At this time, the National Weather Service in Wichita was running on backup power after losing commercial power. However, they did not experience any delays in getting the warnings out to the public. The tornado continued to move northeast and would hit the outskirts of Tawanda. By 7.10 p.m., the Andover tornado finally dissipated west of El Dorado and north of the Kansas Turnpike. All in all, this tornado outbreak saw 55 confirmed tornadoes. Four Oklahoma locations reported four-inch diameter hail. The duration of the outbreak lasted almost 20 hours. The Andover tornado's total path length was 46 miles, with a maximum tornado width of three-quarters of a mile. The highest tornadic circulation winds were 260 to 270 miles per hour. The Andover, Kansas tornado was rated an F5. There were 21 fatalities, 13 from the Golden Spur Mobile Home Park alone, 313 injuries, and damage was 589 million 1991 US dollars. The cost would have been much higher if the tornado hit the B-1B bombers at McConnell Air Force Base, as each one of those bombers cost 280 million US dollars in 1991. One interesting fact is that two of those bombers were armed with nuclear warheads at the time the tornado moved through McConnell Air Force Base. So let's talk about that last fact real quick. Um, it's a great thing for Kansas that it didn't hit the 
nuclear bombs. <laughs> That's not something that you hear every day with a, no. a tornado going through a town. How much worse would the situation have been had the tornado right. hit one of the, the bombers that actually had a nuclear warhead with it? Not only did this town take a direct hit from an F5 tornado, but could you imagine also if a nuclear bomb went up, two nuclear bombs went off as well, just, I, I can't even imagine what the devastation would have looked like. It would have been incredible. And the radiation that would have been scattered downwind from, from right. the storm itself and, and all those effects as well. Not saying that, you know, the tornado would have caused it to detonate, but if it did, you know, think worst case scenario, right. as, as we do with a lot of end of the world movies that we've been watching recently, right. you know, within the 2005 to 2015 range. I'm surprised Hollywood hasn't come up with something like that. Sure. That kind of scenario off sure. of something that was real life. If there is a movie like that, go ahead and comment below what that movie is and we'll take a look at it. Yeah, but going back to, let's, let's talk about the fact that the tornado sirens didn't work. Yes. Um, you've got this massive F5 tornado coming towards your town. It's part of a family of tornadoes. The supercell has been dropping tornadoes for hours beforehand. Here we are, it's finally formed this huge tornado. And A, you're running on backup power. You're still trying to get the warnings out. You happen to get them out on time, but the tornado sirens for the town don't work. And law enforcement has to go out in their own vehicles mm -hmm. and warn people. Tragically, 13 people still died in that uh, mobile home park, but could you imagine what it would have been like if the police didn't get out there and warn people anyways? That's right. And back in 1991, you didn't have social media, so you didn't have the warnings as readily available, say, on right. a cell phone or, or some other means. So, yeah, it was basically boots on the ground to get the warning out when the sirens failed. Let's take a look at some of the clips and footage from this day. Tornadoes, the location's just been updated, moving toward the east-northeast. So folks over the southern half of the city of Wichita, Clearwater, Derby, Hayesville, that entire area are in extreme danger as this tornado moves toward the northeast. That is Hayesville, this is Derby, McConnell Air Force Base is right here. The storm's moving east-northeast, so folks in those areas are in the direct path of this tornado. This is what the Golden Spur trailer park looked like intact, less than 10 minutes before the killer tornado swept through Andover. Sergeant Paul C. of the Andover Police Department weaves up and down the streets, warning residents to take shelter. We have a report of a tornado on the ground hitting a mobile home park. From the air, little is left to distinguish one home from the next. Here, Andover's Golden Spur Mobile Home Park. This is about as classic a hook echo as you are ever going to see. Just after the storm leaves the Andover area, it catches up with motorists on the Kansas Turnpike, including two members of our News Channel 3 team. Get up under the girders. Is that where you want to go? Yes. That one. Hang on to the girders. It sounded like a freight train. It just passed right on top of us. So there was the video we were talking about at the beginning of our case study of folks trying to outrace the tornado and get under an overpass. A lot of information has come out since then about how it's not a good place to hide, specifically because the air gets compressed into a smaller area, which causes the wind flow to increase and could potentially pull you out uh, from underneath the bridge and there have been a number of folks that have had unfortunately had that situation happen to them and they were injured or died yeah and not only do you have the chance of these stronger winds pulling you out from underneath that that safety but because this is kind of acting as a, a faster stream of air a lot of debris gets funneled under there as well you still have a chance of getting hit by all the debris that is now 
funneling under there. And what was talked about later on was when this tornado actually hit the overpass, it was much weaker than, say, an F3, F4, F5. Again, we're using the F scale because it was right. before the enhanced Fujita scale. So there is the Andover tornado from 1991. Now, Andover did have another one recently, and we are going to get to that case study as well. However, this one had, we wanted to really focus on this one because yeah. it was very public at the time. A lot of information was flowing out by the media back then. So we wanted to give this its time and respect um, instead of trying to put both of them together. So we will do the latest Andover tornado in a separate case study. So there you have the April 26, 1991 Andover, Kansas tornado. Again, if you like what you saw, be sure to give this case study a thumbs up and subscribe down below. As we just talked about, we are going to be doing the 2022 Andover, Kansas tornado as well. So you want to stick around for that one. Follow us over on our social media, Facebook, Instagram, popping up here, as well as checking out our School of Weather and our website, which will be linked down below. Down there, you'll also find the links for everything that we use to put this case study together between SPC and the NWS office and all the stuff that they've compiled along with the videos that we use and graphics as well if you guys want to check them out for yourself. Until next time, I'm Kayla. And I'm Jim. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you at the next Meteorology Monday.